Today's episode is brought to you by the Vegas Beer Guys and the Sounds and Cinema Podcast. Everything sequel contains explicit language. And why the fudge not, you melon farmer? Hello and welcome to the Everything Sequel Podcast. This is the 1982 Singles Edition. Today, we're talking Piranha 2, The Spawning. My name is Michael Schantz. I am from the How Dare You Awards. Joining me, of course, Tom Stewart from Lonesome Whistle Productions. You got to come up with a whole new quotable, Tom. Give it to me. Anybody doing stuff to fish? <laughs> I've... I feel really bad about using that quotable because, ti- as as listeners may know, typically the the quotable is mocking a line of dialogue from the movie. Whereas this, in context, this line um, is completely appropriate. It's the point at which Tyler, the undercover government biochemist, is wait, overplaying. Wait, wait, yeah, he's overplaying his secret identity. So I'm this sorry. line is, I'm a, s- is showing I'm sorry, these that... Char- these... <laughs> these characters had names? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so of it's... Of course, ladies... It, it, like, anything else ahead, in, like, like anything else in this movie, if you rip it from the movie, it's baffling. But in context... <laughs> it, but right, in context, it perfect it's sense. It nominally makes sense. It's actually well, a good line. I feel voice, bad for using it. The questioning voice you heard was coming from our special guest star, Matthew Aldrich, Hollywood veteran and co-writer of Coco. Hello, Matt. <laughs> oh, hello, both of you. Um, How are you? I'm so Hi. good. I've been looking forward to this moment ever since I watched Piranha 2, The Spawning. Uh, I am fucking ready for this i was ready to hate this movie and me too and i think my first note was is it possible to hate a movie only 10 seconds into it i right the 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 (laughs) start of this movie is so poor it's so (laughs) yeah it's so lazy it's so poor and lazy i i i when i started this movie i I physically winced and i thought oh god this is (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is a a truly amateurish effort we're about to watch here. And then they finally cut away from the first shot and yeah. and what and what ended up happening was one of my favorite things, which is an unintentionally funny movie and an unintentionally baffling movie. I'm yeah. I, I I will put this out here. I am I am such a fan of movies that are so bad they're good. This is the perfect movie if you're looking to um, watch this movie with uh, uh, some friends and some beers. Like this and is some the, this is the movie, and some enemies maybe. <laughs> if this is this is the movie you, them you want to. This is the movie you, you want down. to watch. This is a movie where you sit down with your enemies, and if you're still angry at the end, at the end of it, go ahead and kill each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This will make friends. I out defy of you. you to still be mad at each other at the end of Piranha Two: The Spawning, um, or The Flying Killers. I mean, this is this movie. Um, it never. There's never a dull moment. No. There's never a. It, it never. It never falls in strangely it never falls into uh convention it um uh in terms of there are some big swings that it takes here like there's there's, oh yeah this is not a safe movie whereas i feel like when we were talking about grease 2 and airplane 2 and the finkelman uh effect i think (laughs) as it is now (laughs) finkelman (laughs) i think for me the hallmark of for yeah. me, the hallmark of Ken Finkelman is that he plays it safe. He's completely Definitely. and he takes two he takes two original films. You know, we talked about Greece being 
risque. We talked about airplane being sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, really kind of out Racist, there. Misogynist. Well, no, no, but like the original <laughs> airplanes, the original airplane movie being sort of a, uh, um, a big swing in its form and its sure, content yeah, 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 yeah. and everything. In of a very, you know, nobody had ever yeah. really seen a movie like that before. Right. Um, and so Finkelman took those two things and said, well, what if we did a completely middle of the road version <laughs> um, and just played it safe and recycled jokes and just hit the marks. And here we have Piranha 2, which is the directorial debut of James Cameron, and we'll get into kind of? we'll get Question into that mark. story. <laughs> but what we have here is we, what we have here is something that happened a lot in the uh, late '70s and early '80s, which is um, out of the Roger Corman factory, some right. very well-known and big directors emerged, and Cameron was one of them. Joe Dante is another one. Ron Howard is another one. Ted Demi, uh, yeah, Ted Demi. Um, uh, even even actors like Jack Nicholson sort of came through that system as yeah. as well, and it was a system. Right. It was a system that um, taught directors how to make something out of nothing. They, their budgets were incredibly constrained, and um, you know it was like you know they would make a movie because they you know found a set in a dumpster somewhere and mm -hmm. they were like well we found a spaceship spaceship set it's co it cost us 17 dollars um so let's make a space movie you know and that was sort of how they operated and they um, managed to spend 17 dollars on something they found in the dumpster well to get it from the dumpster to the to the um, uh, location <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I great... skipped that part. I, I I was thinking the logistics. Well, like you can't shoot it in the alley, so <laughs> let's. We got. It's got to be okay. It's 1977. I love that you just built a whole little story there. 1977. How how much does it cost? You got to get a truck. I'm going to say 17 dollars to get that across <laughs> Glendale. I I don't know. I don't know if Coleman is is dishing out 17 dollars. That's the he'd other thing. He was so he was so stingy, probably get a right? homeless stingy, guy yes. to just. He'd probably play like pay a homeless guy three dollars to walk it across town. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Um, and There's so, a great and the thing is, Matt. Like for me, I I had the exact same journey you did at the beginning because the beginning of this movie, two people near as I can tell are trying to have sex in a sunken ship. You said at it. At least fifty <laughs> feet under the water in a sunken ship. Yes. And I thought. My first thought was, what the fuck? And it looks as awkward on screen as it sounds as we're talking about it. Yes. And then, of course, they get killed. And this is followed by blood red animation mm -hmm. for the credits. Yes. And I thought, we're in a lot of fucking trouble here. Yes, but, but at and the so same the time. the turnaround I had on this movie astonished me where, you know, somewhere around a quarter of the way through, I thought, Am I loving this movie? <laughs> it took what? you that long? Well, I'm interested to, I'm interested to hear, Mike, because you you Jaws is a beloved film to you. And this wow. Piranha <laughs> time favorite, as we've discussed. Piranha is one of the many carbon copies of Jaws that were that was made in the wake of Jaws. Including sure. Jaws and 2. Piranha 2 including Jaws 2 like like there were you know the piranha there was you know killer fish there was a killer orca there's orca. The killer spiders there was just everything it was just free um, willy you know let's free willy you know that was the best um that was you know that was that was that was the, I still that was remember the best a... whale movie ever made maybe yeah <laughs> i'll say well, that okay to 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 that exact point James Cameron is famous for saying that he thinks this is the absolute hands down best movie about flying piranha that's ever been made. I would agree with that. I don't think you can deny him that. No. Although you and also James Cameron himself has said, I didn't really direct that movie. So let's get into this just at least for a moment. OK. Can I just say I a few in... things about the cold open? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sorry. Um, like, I, the, the first thing, I, I'm i so glad that, Matt, you brought up um, thriftiness mm -hmm. and, and Roger Corman, because the first thing I wrote, uh, cold open, ADR and long shot, yes. already thrifty. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, to your point, Mike, about the, 
about you know they're going to a sunken ship to have sex question mark i i i i wrote what wait were they talking about diving the whole time and not sex if so it's a shit hot <laughs> comic intro to the movie and then okay so they're having sex in a boat at the bottom of the sea triple punchline also boobs and jaws pastiche so yeah i love this cold open but to your other point about James Cameron basically disowning this movie. If you watch the the rare James Cameron laser disc cut of this movie, the entire cold open disappears. So, this oh, is the wow. beginning well, of his that... dissatisfaction with the movie. <laughs> I I can see that. I it, it, well, Mike, finish your story about how what the circumstances of Cameron's involvement right. and then so, getting fired off of it. And then we can kind of, I think as you go through the movie, we can sort of say like, does this feel Cameron or does this feel Carlo? That's the most remarkable thing to me about this movie. This movie feels exactly like an early Cameron film. You can see the bones of Cameron film throughout this movie to me. This feels like a James Cameron movie yet. <laughs> the producers and the studio when uh, the first thing i read was the producers and the studio were not going to allow a non-american name to be listed as the director they would not let an italian man's name mm. be listed as director which made me think what a bunch of fucking assholes so they hired james cameron james cameron got hired in the earnest thought that he was going to be directing this movie the so i guess it's not the, the producers but the studio because the producer is well oh, i was gonna say because G the because it's it's a it, it's a bit of a you know it's that's a smokescreen because literally everyone else on the production team is italian so yeah right you, like yeah. even even and if it, was, you have it was it was cut in rome yeah, but yeah, right. like I mean, that's the, the studio's obviously thinking that no one's going to look beyond the director's name in the credits because literally no one else is American who made this movie. Right? Yeah, that's the... yeah, and so that 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 they would hire Cameron as a kind of beard. Um, yes, it is, is a, strange. Is a strange thing. Well, I mean, back up though, in terms of the genesis of this project, you got to take a step back. Um, even further than that for me and you, you look at piranha one and um you know piranha one was roger corman production joe, joe dante. dante direct directed and it was a uh huge success financially um it it, it played in theaters for a very long time um it, it it was part of this era of b movies um where where they were kind of on the decline and this was a um piranha was a a real bright spot and it was sort of a a no-brainer it was not the swarm it was not the swarm yeah i mean it, the, b movies were the spawn b, as as the as as hollywood blockbusters uh grew in the late 70s and early 80s um they took up more and more screens which which sort of elbowed out the b movies who by 1982 right. and 1983 kind of didn't have anywhere left to go and that's when they migrated then to what what they called C movies, which is straight to cable, um, because it was around that time that uh, cable became 24 hours, and right. you know, and so that they they sort of left the screen. So Piranha One marked a, a sort of a final like death rattle <laughs> of of the B movies. Like this, mm. its success was so singular that to. To, to make a second one was kind of a no-brainer. And then uh, it's unclear to me exactly why uh, Corman lost control of, of it, but it, it, it the, the rights to the franchise fell in the hands of this Italian production company and mm -hmm. producer. Is it, who, did it fall into the hands of Sinitas himself? I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't have that in front of me. Um, okay. Because um, that's the guy who wanted to direct it but wouldn't be allowed and decided whoever would come over, he's going to fire anyway. Yeah. So they found Cameron, who was working under um, under uh, um, Corman, 
Mm-hmm. As a as an like an art director um, on some films, he was he was kind of like everybody kind of did everything on these films, and so he he was hungry for his first chance behind the lens, and so he left the Corman camp to to direct this film. And the irony for me is that uh, on one hand, now he has this story. Cameron has this story to sort of shield himself from take, from from owning you know Piranha Two. Yeah. Um, had had Piranha Two stayed with Corman and had he directed it, he would never have been fired. That was not Corman's style. Like he just he would say, "Just go make the movie." Like you have seven yeah, days, right. seven days, go make the movie. Like Corman, he would <laughs> he would have been given like he would have had to make the whole thing. And I I I actually I'm I I, I would have liked to see um, this actually be uh, Cameron's sort of first movie no right. excuses yeah. no questions asked um um but what we have now is this hybrid of a movie hybrid right we have this um platypus of a movie <laughs> <laughs> that is that is um so engaging at so many different levels in that in that you can watch it on the it's so bad it's good but you can also as a lover of film and a and a and and you know a bit of a student of the era you can look at this as as such a an amazing artifact um as a movie Absolutely. that like that kind of ha- like i'm so glad i finally watched this i i, I well, just he, have well, to he, say i'm just so glad i watched it i mean i go even further than hybrid i mean we talked about how airplane 2 and grease 2 are disjointed and they're serving too many masters this movie is straight up schizophrenic there, I mean, there, there is, there's two movies going on simultaneously in parallel. One is an updated Jane Austen novel set in a beach hotel. The other is a beat for beat Jaws pastiche. Okay, that's in front of the camera. Behind the camera, we've got James Cameron, um, like the uh, the early version of a James Cameron movie, and you know, regardless of what he did or didn't direct. Um, he either brought something to the table or he took it from the same table to eat later. That's my that's uh, that's how I feel about James Cameron's contribution, including the presence of Lance Hendrickson. And yeah. on the other side, you've got mm-hmm. a production team which who think they're making an Italian giallo film, blood, sex, knives, uh, in the style of Dario Argento. And I find that duality fascinating, very compelling. But it really is a duality because um, those four ideas of what this movie is, uh, a movie is intersect once, maybe twice in the entire movie. So it's like it's like an accidental version of um, Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors. <laughs> wow! So that's my that's my hot take on like. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I know what you mean about there's there's moments where I think, oh, if Cameron, you know, if Cameron was able to direct this, he could have made it feel more whole. Mm-hmm. But, but the the other side, I'm like, I'm like this. I'm really getting something from this this kind of like unofficial split screen movie that I'm watching. Yeah, and I think that's for me why the film never got boring. For sure. Because I honestly didn't know what was next. I didn't know what, like you say, like what kind of movie I was going to be in next. Was I in a coming of age film? Was I in a certain moment? I was like, when did this turn into Blue Lagoon? <laughs> With <Right>. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, and I, so I, 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 I would even mention like, the kind of the, the underwater uh, aspects. That's a whole other movie, too. Well, so you have the underwater booby sexy scene, and then right after that, you have, you don't know for sure, but you're assuming a son and a mother, and the son appears to be putting a fish in mom's bed strictly to try and see her boobs. Now, the audience never gets to see the boobs, but this was alarming to me. I'm like, isn't that kid her son? Yeah, because he looks like he wants to see her naked underneath those sheets. They have definitely had sex. 
this mother and son. <laughs> This well, is the, no. this is the strangest mother and son since Psycho, and it's completely unaddressed in this movie. It is there is nothing about the weirdness of their relationship that plays into the plot, the themes, the story, anything. It is this singular. That's what I'm saying. It's this is the platypus of the movie. It's like this is the duck bill on the movie that you just <laughs> kind of have to live with. That that this my I just wrote. I wrote, I had a big, um, you know, note about the first scene. Um, and, uh, and then I wrote second scene and just in all caps, I just wrote, that's his mom. Like I couldn't, to me, I wasn't, I like, again, you, you start with this cold open where it's the same cold open as Jaws. It's instead of skinny dipping, it's skinny scuba diving. Um, and, and, you know, in the, in the, tradition of horror films you know the sexually promiscuous are killed off first um and uh and so then it goes to this you know protracted title sequence with animated blood is one of these title sequences where you're going like oh they just needed to make this at least 84 minutes so they made seven of those minutes a title sequence and then they finally (laughs) kind of settle into the story and you have for me what i thought was let me set the scene because I'm going to guess nobody listening has seen this movie. So you come up on a, on a bed and you are panning slowly over the form of a sleeping woman. You're starting at her at her legs, the you know, sort of the rise of her hips and it's the sheets kind of come over. She's sleeping and she's sleeping in the nude. You get to her face and she's a sleeping woman. She's, you know, um, she's. Uh, probably in her late 30s, early 40s, um, and and then you see a a, a fish um, enter the frame, <laughs> and the fish is connected to a hand, and the hand is connected to a much younger man, and he's waking her up and kind of trying to s- startle her. I think by you know she wakes up to a, a fish. She wakes up. She's not startled by a fish being in her face. This seems like maybe the 15th time. A, right. a fish she He's has like, that kind of like business as usual yeah she has yeah she's like oh the fish thing again and the man <laughs> kind of snuggles into her and they're joking about what kind of fish it is and they both know the latin name for the fish and but not a man by the way it's a boy. it's a boy it's a boy um a boy of about you know 19 and and i'm thinking like all right well she's like she's just she's she's that woman who just like is is landing the 19 year old you know like cabin boy or something like this at the at the resort and then at a certain point either he says mom or something happens and my brain (laughs) cracked my skull split open and 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 everything i thought i knew just oozed out and that was the moment where I was like, I, this might be the best movie ever made. <laughs> but because... You're absolutely right, Matt, when you say that Cameron is like, you know, he's a beard for the production, but he's also kind of like the cover story for all the, all the weird, um, incestuous shit that happens in this movie, because I yes. didn't think as much of it because I knew it was a James Cameron film. I'm like, okay, a sweet mother-child relationship with a disturbing sexual undercurrent. Seems like a James Cameron movie to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is upsetting. In in <laughs> in abstract it it's is upsetting. totally upsetting. It's totally upsetting. And and then they have breakfast together and i i was terrified that they were going to start making out after breakfast it, the... you go, yeah you break out in a cold sweat wondering what's gonna happen between these two next they are flirting with each other so heavily and they're so their faces are so close together yeah. over breakfast <laughs> as, i as mean this... everyone to be fair there's something on this island that is making people horny as hell and, and crazy it is mm-hmm. i mean you know the movie begin the cold open is all about you know having sex at the bottom of the ocean and that is a fitting intro to you know every around every corner you know some someone's horniness is lurking around every corner of this movie when they later on when they go into the morgue they open a 
they open a closet door and there's a there's like pin, nude pinups inside. I'm like, everyone on this island is, you know, has the raging horn all the time. So, and yeah, and it gets I guess them into the, I guess this mother and son are just about holding it together. They're like seconds away from from committing an illegal act. <laughs> I think it's happened. I don't think they're seconds away. I think they're I think they're days from. That's what I think. <laughs> oh man. I you know, I, I would say it's... like to, to give again for anybody who hasn't seen this movie, which is everyone. Which um, is everyone. Um, yeah. Hey, it's on YouTube. You can watch it for free. You can watch both versions of this movie for free on YouTube. Yeah. And I suggest you go do that. I and they're I, both I, really good versions of it as well, with subtitles. I'm, I'm a, I'm a which fierce, you're gonna I'm a, need. I'm a fierce defender of copyright, but I, for, I'll make an exception, um, um, <laughs> because I feel like th- they should show this in schools. <laughs> I mean, like this is fair use, um, because in it's retrospect, so I would have happily paid for it. Both. I think I, I would have paid. I would have paid for both both cuts. What? Yeah, oh, I paid for it twice. Um, this, so to just kind of encapsulate the movie, what you have is this kind of, again, Jaws ripoff and, you know, it, it takes place at this resort, you know, in, let's say Jamaica, you know, this Caribbean resort and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, series of, of bizarre accidents, murders, um, alerts the, uh, uh, local sheriff, uh, played by Lance Hendrickson, who has, cars boats and a helicopter at his disposal and he knows how to <laughs> he knows how to say, pilot all of them by he, the way he knows how to drive fly yeah or steer every fucking known mode of transportation he, 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 he is he is he's a jack of all trades um so he is our sheriff brody um but our main character is his ex-wife um the father of mother boy um, very much Cameron, by the way, like female lead at the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and she is the sort of it's she is the scuba diver sure. instructor, scuba. The, yeah, or a, or a um, um, Terminator. You know, the, yeah. the movie he did yeah. after this was Terminator, um, and that was that was um, uh, again. You sort of see like the the, um, the 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 bones, the woman in the middle who is who who everyone sort of sees as hysterical. Um, and spends much of the movie trying to convince everybody that right. there's something going on, something bigger going on, um, and nobody believes her except one man believes her, um, and then that one man clues her into um, the bigger conspiracy that's the happening. Bigger picture, um, yeah. and that one man is this kind of smarmy um, student in in the scuba uh, class who is hitting on her, hitting on her, hitting on her, um, uh, and then we find out. Um, he is part of a massive and bizarre government, government conspiracy. conspiracy that explains the fish <laughs> and helps her uh, destroy the the you know go you know take out all the piranha um, by the end and and that is your story in a, in a nutshell. Now, what I love about this movie is that it <laughs> there's it, another nutshell. It, it, there's yeah. another nutshell yeah, and what... another one and another one. <laughs> And then, then they smash the, all the nutshells, smash and mix up together, and it's just this there, there, pile of broken a, nutshells. There's <laughs> an entirely <laughs> independent storyline, but you keep picking out a delicious hunt. pieces of nuts to eat. <laughs> there, there is, there is a, there is a storyline that, you know, as I said, it, you know, the, there's a storyline that is is pure J- Jane Austen. It's about women looking for single women looking for husbands. And lots of different social types <laughs> all mingling, um, but is based around like the culmination of that storyline is a grunion hunt, right? Yes, it, yes. I mean, the it's fish not are like... even subject to the horniness of the island. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's so... called the spawning. The whole movie is called the spawning. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, all right, let's let's take a break, uh, and then we're gonna come back and we'll dive deep. Go away, go watch it on YouTube, and come back. (laughs) (laughs) And then come back. You can do that in under 90 minutes. I cannot stress this enough. (laughs) And you'll be right back here, and we're going to lead you through it. We'll be right back after this. (laughs) 
I like to think I know something about beer, but nowadays even I get overwhelmed when confronted by the exhaustive selection of craft beers they have at bars, breweries, and even grocery stores. Back in the day you had one, maybe two craft beers to choose from, and if you were confused, you ordered a Guinness. But in beer stations like San Diego, the craft beer options lately are in double, sometimes even triple, digits. So what's a beer drinker to do? You need what I need, the Vegas Beer Guys. Your beer of choice should be a perfect blend of malt and hops. And so a live show about beer needs that same balance. And the Vegas Beer Guys matches beer expert Dan Aker with self-proclaimed beer novice Stephen J. Weiss. The results are eminently drinkable. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They'll try new beers. They'll tell you about beer. Think of them as your beer sherpas guiding you up a foamy-headed mountain to reach the peak of your pint. God, I need a beer. And we're back. The three of us are here discussing Piranha 2, The Spawning, a 1982 movie sort of directed by James Cameron. He at least spent two weeks directing this movie. (laughs) Uh, By the way, from what I understand, this guy, Ovidio G. Asinidis, wanted to direct it himself, was told he couldn't. They got some guy named Miller Drake to direct for a day. He fired him. Then I think Hmm. James Cameron got hired. He started directing. He got fired after a week or two. This guy started directing it himself. (laughs) James Cameron started seeing dailies and started sneaking into a room and cutting his own version at night, Mm -hmm. which Asanitas found out about and then started destroying what he was making to make his own. That's how fucked up the the behind-the-scenes shit for this movie was. Well, given that, it's actually actually fairly coherent, a movie. Right? I was just going to (laughs) say. So I find it fascinating that it's as coherent in a batshit crazy movie as it is. And also, I find it remarkable that it feels like as much of an early James Cameron movie as it does. So uh, here's what I want to ask the both of you. When, uh, maybe we already have Matt's answer. When did you start fall, like truly falling in love with this movie? Is it that moment with the fish at the beginning, Matt, for you? I wouldn't say with, I fell with in Mom? love with it ever. I don't think I fell in, like, I never fell under its spell. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think I I was when I describe um, the moment when I realized that that is a mother and a son. You know, when when I realized that that's actually where the movie went and that's the choice that they made, and how those actors chose to play it that day, and how the director said <laughs> that day th- that was <laughs> that that's the one you got it when they were. Flirting with each other and clearly off script. Like there was a check moment where they're the fucking gate. Check the we gate. Got it. Print. That was the one. <laughs> they are flirting with each other off script. Um, it was one of those as they're flirting with each other over the scrambled eggs. <laughs> it was one of those moments where they'd clearly reached the end of the scene, and the and the director <laughs> kind of did that gesture with his hand where it was like, keep rolling keep going and the and the actors just improvised a few more moments and a few more lines and a giggle and like a little touch to the nose and i went they kept that they <laughs> fucking kept that that was the one yeah they don't they yeah no one saw it as a problem no one they, right i i'm always about like things that get past the gatekeepers you yeah. know and and that got past all the gatekeepers and then they cut to the next scene and uh, there was no further mention of the problems between this mother and son. So um, much so that it takes her a remarkably long time to start worrying about her missing son. Oh, that we're that, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. All um, right. Because because well, I, there's a whole say... story with mother boy having to go out on his own and sort of fight for his own 
like if they had called this movie Piranha 2 um, First Mate Mother Boy, I would have been fine with it. Like <laughs> like his his story First Mate Mother Boy. <laughs> his story is so fascinating. This kid's trying to sort of like differentiate himself from his a really terrible mother-son relationship. Um, uh, so he goes out to sea only to be hounded by his father in a very ghost-like haunting way. Um, you know, who, his father just sort of appears like Hamlet's father. Um, in, in a different mode of transport every, every time. Every time, helicopter. By boat, by a helicopter. Boat, like a, a submarine at one point, I think. Uh, <laughs> and 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 his story is only complete once he's able to uh, strike up and consummate a new relationship with somebody his own age. In fact, probably somebody much younger than him, uh, inappropriately so. Uh, um, uh, and 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 what I wanted, what I I wished had happened was that I wished that Mother Boy was still sort of involved in the in the climax of the film. That came out wrong, but um, uh, uh, I think. To answer your question, though, like it was that moment of realizing that like this is the movie I'm in. I'm in the movie Mm. of baffling choices. Okay, I'm I'm in the movie of of uh, I am topsy turvy. I'm through the looking glass here, and I and that was when I started to become truly sort of morbidly entertained. Okay, so I'll agree with that because I have that same feeling for that same moment. But I think I also was thinking. At that time, it was so early in the movie that I thought, okay, maybe that's just one batshit side story thing. It doesn't really, you know, we're not talking about what this movie's really about. So when the first people die, my moment is when the first people die and they go sneak into the morgue. Yes. And then a flying piranha that has burrowed itself inside of the corpse. Mm-hmm. Appears, attacks a, 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 a nurse. A nurse, or, right? Yeah, it was a well, nurse. A mo- or... Morgue assistant. Morgue yeah. assistant. We'll, we'll see that job title nurse. again in Halloween 3. Yeah. <laughs> so it attacks a nurse in the neck, kills her, yep. and then jumps up through yep. a window yep. and flies away. That's when I was decided then and there, I will passionately defend this movie to my <laughs> dying day. Yeah, you've never seen a um, a fish jump out of a corpse, kill a woman, and escape through a plate glass window. <laughs> you've never seen it, and, and you Having never will again. Having that plate glass window do no damage. It was funny. Mm. It was like, it was, uh, you know, between between the fish coming out of the dead body and Lance Hendrickson, I was like... Am I watching Aliens? Like, is this is this is right. this kind of well, feels I, like? I, I was gonna say that, that, like, you know, this isn't the first time James Cameron has remade Alien. Uh, like, <laughs> like, sorry, this is the first. Like, Aliens is not the first time that James Canyon, James Cameron, has remade Alien. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, later on, later on, there are people crawling through the vents of a sunken ship. I'm like, what the fuck yeah. is going on here? But for me, I was earlier than both of you. Oh, God. The moment I fell in love with this movie or (laughs) minimally knew what I was getting myself into was uh, when having having written down in my notes and uh, in every kind of every kind of iteration of titling that I'd seen, this movie was Piranha 2 The Spawning. The opening titles came up and the title... Piranha 2 The Flying Killers came up. And I thought, you know, it made me instantly think of that great gag in the grind in the Tarantino um, Rodriguez Grindhouse movies. It's certainly in Death Proof. I don't know if it's in Planet Terror 2. Um, where, where the title comes up and is immediately redacted and replaced with a different title. Um... <laughs> I saw so it made me think of of that which is it's like is is that what is that what's happening here it's like it's a it's a kind of you know just a it's just a straight title change that is still somehow in the movie or I was thinking of going back to airplane police squad where the the episode titles that are said in the voiceover are never matched by what's on screen and I kind of thought right, right. I thought this could be both or either. 
and that's the movie I'm about to watch. <laughs> a movie where they haven't even decided, where they have two titles, yes, neither of agree. which at any point are disputed in the movie. Yeah, the movie doesn't know what it wants to call itself. But the movie could so, be called either. Right? Yeah. It could be called many things. I wrote down some other um, possible titles, um, you know, for like <laughs> First Mate Mother Boy, um, The Adventures of Sheriff Steve, um, Naked Lady Pirates. Um, oh, I have Nude Lady Pirates too. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, you call something Piranha 2 Naked Lady Pirates, I think you'll get, you know, at least the first weekend. Um, ticket sales. You know, people are going to have to come check that I out. I actually have a note here that says the naked lady pirates are mean. Yeah, that was disappointing to you? <laughs> you wanted them to have a heart well, of gold? I mean, let, let's... Let, <laughs> to, me, to me, in this movie, there's like a hierarchy of characterization. There's a kind of... There's a level of characterization which is relatively earnest, grounded, and develops you know your steves your ann's your tyler's kind of by the way i think trisha o'neill was a really strong actor like she's really good in this movie i'm kind of disappointed we don't know her better in other movies so you have what that one level you have all you have like one dimensional cartoon caricatures uh you know epitomized by mal the stuttering chef and then yeah. there's kind of like yeah. subdimensional characters, like the fat guy uh, at the Grunion Hunt who says the only fat guy is gonna win this race, and then runs away. Y- yes, to get to the beach early and everyone else. So I feel yeah, I mean his whole plan is to sneak up. It closer. runs the gamut of how you do character in fiction. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I I never and there are a lot of characters I feel would be perfectly suited to an episode of Gilligan's Island. Oh yeah, or 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 Love Boat. I felt like I felt like I was on the Love Boat. It was a Love Boat that never moved uh, because everybody was there, as you're saying, to like satisfy this. uh, It was Love Boat at port. Yes, it was. It was. (laughs) You know, I'm thinking of. I don't remember the character's name, so I'll I'll call her the poor man's Bette Midler. Um, who was the, yeah, the, the woman? The woman on the beach who um, right. was just trying to get with everyone and anyone, especially the you know the cabin boy, um, and was always kind of like writhing, you know, because she yeah. was yes. so she 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 had no bodily control, um, and, and that's how she played it. And it was um, <laughs> it was like watching sort of uh, you know. This this week on Love Boat, you know, like Phyllis Diller stars as the um, undersexed Sex widow, yeah. um, you know, and and uh, and she finds love, you know, uh, she has a you know w- one night with uh, you know Captain Steubing um, that you know changes her world. But the, 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 like having a character like that, I didn't know whether or not I was supposed to find her funny. Uh, it, it 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 had a sore thumb quality uh, to it. And what what makes this movie um, special and weird and, and watchable is that it is a movie consisting entirely of sore thumbs. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, as you're saying, Tom, like every kind of weird choice for character that you can make, you make. They make. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't, like, I can't say it enough. Like, like the, I forget the the... I don't like to learn characters' names because it's just it's too it takes too long. So, uh, uh, oh, you the, should hear us on other episodes. Blonde guy, brunette dude. Well, uh, um, I, I call me before I knew the, the guy the who's Tyler trying to get with called, Anne. Before I knew Tyler was called Tyler, I put him as Hugh Grant guy's secret agent. Oh, okay. Because he's so, essentially yes, that, so he's, he's Tyler. essentially Hugh Grant in the Colin Firth, Hugh Grant, Bridget Jones. Uh, love triangle that's going on in this movie. <laughs> yes, he is the episodes, one that you, that Anne, you don't want Anne to be with. Nephew or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he shows up like a you know typically smarmy guy, just always hitting on the the scuba instructor, our main character, and mm-hmm. she's kind of like holding him off, but in that early eighties way where it was like all 
all no's meant yes. It's you know? a given it, that we will have sex. Yeah, it's 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 just really it's 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 a hard thing to sort of watch coming in slow motion. You know, scene after scene, you're like, oh god, he's gonna wear her down, and this is just gonna be really sad. And and he Sorry does. Sorry for the he... Titanic reference, but uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. We've still got yes. Halloween three season of the witch to come. Oh, it... oh, oh, we will get god. there. We, we Women's get availability there. to inappropriate <laughs> men. I have never wanted to see a love scene less than the love scene in Ever. Halloween 3. We're not there yet, boys. We're not there yet. Oh. Um, but it's, part of the, it's definitely part of the same syndrome. It is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It, There's a it's Venn part of the same here. ethic. Yeah. And and so and so we we we're so, I'm sort of like because I'm I'm I have become sort of a connoisseur of these movies. I I because you you see You're this welcome. coming and you go, yes, and you go <laughs> you go you go. Oh my God, they're gonna get together and then they do, and then he says, "I'm actually with the government." And I went, "Holy <laughs> fucking shit!" I I I truly did not see any of that coming. And he now he stops being uh, uh, Hugh Grant and now he's Michael Bain. And he's there to kind of like lay out what's really going on, and the government plot be behind these genetically engineered piranha who can survive in salt water and who fly and who like are they are essentially the 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 mogwai you fed after midnight. They are unstoppable in number well, and ferocity, and then you you sort of set yourself up for the second half of the movie, which just delivers on the promise of military grade fish uh, you, you right. it, it 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 doesn't title. pull a punch yes military grade fish would have been another um uh, maybe a warning like a trigger warning <laughs> at the bottom you know you know i've never i've never thought of doing like an exposition dump um while a character's eating dinner over a fridge but it kind of works. <laughs> I think that's one of the better. I mean, we talked in a previous uh, the, uh, the, when we did the Die Hard series about how um, like naked Tai Chi with exposition over it right. kind of just distracted me from what was being said. Here, I think it's the right balance. It's like you, you're watching a guy eat dinner over a fridge. You're still listening to what's being said. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did anybody give and like did you care at all about the science of this where he's in no. earnest describing to her how they genetically modified the fish to include flying fish which really mean fly you know he all he says is that <laughs> we gave them the the abilities of flying fish but fly and grunions they just yeah, yes, they the, just the, the, glide over the water for about four feet. They don't leave the water and go wherever the fuck they want. I didn't care for a second. I, I didn't care. I, I didn't think so. I mean, no. I didn't at the end of the day, too. But I, I just think, love that just not a, an ounce of thought or care is given to that in this movie. But it's what the strangest thing, the strangest thing about work. that is, and again, I think this is part of Tyler overplaying his, his cover story a little bit, but... When they talk about the piranhas from the first movie, which are explicitly said, these aren't the same piranhas. <laughs> That's a line of dialogue. <laughs> these aren't the same piranhas. Um, they say, it sounds like something, he says, it sounds like something from the National Enquirer. It's like, wait a minute, so you don't believe that, but flying piranhas... That <laughs> that seems perfectly that flies. Legitimate. Yeah, yeah, that flies. It's like you're trying you're trying too hard to make this seem normal. If you're like if you're making out that the events of the first movie are far fetched, <laughs> I I didn't pause for a second at any of that because for me it it was this amazing moment where the movie kind of retconned the first half. Where, yeah, that's true. Where yeah. it's it's basically said like okay. All your questions. All your are questions. Be we're going to answer them <laughs> yeah. all right now. Why yeah. these fish are here? That's right. Why they're around that sunken ship? <laughs> what I'm doing here? Why I like you? Um, what or pretending to like you? Um, why we can't just nuke the ship? 
why we have to, you know, he was he he, he was he was he was Michael Bain, but he was also Paul Reiser in in Aliens, where he's like, well, 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 but we can't just destroy them. We need to save a few because it has a purpose. Um, so uh, uh, it, it was this wonderful um, shift where, like, every, like the movie just ex- answered every question you had, and I felt like, all right. Like I, I did feel, I, I have to admit, in that moment, I went, okay. Yeah. yeah. You did answer every, I, you know, I still have a couple of questions, but I, hey, I don't the care government about the did answers, some fucked so up shit in Vietnam. Let's go just, forward. Just, just get with it. <laughs> right. 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 This, this, um, um, that, you know, again, it's, uh, it, this might be a Cameron thing that there, that, there are bigger systems at play and those systems have uh they 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 are corporations with a profit motive that have co-opted the government yeah Mm -hmm. you know for the purpose of conquest and profit like that's the that's sort of the worldview of you know it's why um you know Yes, it's 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 the it's the government you know it's the government agency you know b- behind the marine um, uh, uh, invasion of the of the you know the, the the marine rescue operation in aliens. It's the same sure. mm-hmm. sort of big big bad government thing epitomized by Giovanni Ribisi in, in, in yeah, Avatar. Yeah, in Avatar, right? Right. It's the it's the um, and and then in the Terminator movies, it's the um, you know uh, what's the company. It the, the what's the name of it? The Skynet. Skynet. Right. So that is one of those things where it felt very Cameron. And in the same way, like that is a that is a, um, a an archetype. That's a story that sort of exists outside of Cameron, too. And it's and I think yeah. it's one of these these levers that he knows how to pull to sort of signal. Um, it's one of these levers he knows how to pull to sort of diffuse any questions you have about the premise of his movie. He just Definitely. goes big big faceless corporation we're going to call it skynet and absolutely and and so all and this corporation is so big and has so much money and so much resources at its disposal that it can it can accomplish anything um including mastering time travel and sending you know human you know androids you know killing machines and um you know, you don't it, know how far the conspiracy goes. Yeah, it's that yeah. it's that kind of thing <laughs> right. where it sort of buys it buys the movie narrative latitude where you're yeah. where you as a as an audience member we're we're sort of trained to stand down with all of our questions <laughs> when we when we hear something like that and Cameron knows how to throw that switch. It's one of the things that he does really well, and yeah. and when. Other people sometimes try to do it, and it doesn't come off as it comes off as hokey. Um, and so that's when that's that's one of these typically um, sort of, or or not even typically because it was his first film, but it's one of these things where you go like, oh, he he this this feels like him. This feels like a choice he made. And as you're saying, like there was nothing sort of dynamic about the way it was shot, but the information dump of it was like, yeah, this it feels like he found something in this seen in this moment and he we will see him use this again throughout his his career sure um he will he will this will be part of his the, storytelling and it's kind of it kind of in i mean the the first piranha movie and this piranha movie are also riffing on the kind of spielbergian trope um from you know jaws and other movies of of the individual against like a local or a national government um, although here it is seems to be the management of the hotel, rather than I was a, gonna say yes. that. rather than like a ra- the Raul, sh- the, the manager yeah. of the hotel, ra- is like the the mayor from Jaws, but as he's played the, by a gay angry man. Yeah, it's um. So there's there's kind of yeah, it's, that going the, the on, and it's intersecting is... with this with this idea of that that there is this this kind of corporate entity as well that we're fighting. I mean. I, I sort of, and Mike's probably not going to enjoy me saying this, but I, I kind of like where, where they kind of deviated from the, from the <laughs> Jaws storyline. I kind of like those changes making, making Anne the Brody 
you know, the, the woman who's trying to get everything closed down and it taking a while for Steve, who is another Brody like character to get on board with it. Um, I kind of like that in the no, same yeah, way. I in like Greece too, I like the kind of gender reversal, uh, and it's certainly done yeah. better than yeah. here than it is in like Jaws the Revenge, which is a similar kind of like Brody's wife coming to the fore, becoming the person telling everyone they should be afraid of what's beneath the water. Right. But this is a lot of everything more accomplished than that. <laughs> Was anybody else completely shocked by by hotel management when she, you know, when we finally have enough information that we know that people are going to die, and she says, I, you know. I don't think I should be doing any lessons. And he's like, come on, this is how we make money. And she says, no, not only that, I think you have to close everything. People will die. And he just goes, all right, you're fired. It's it's yeah. funny. I mean, in, again, in a way, it makes slightly more My sense. My note than, is, man, that happened fast. It made slightly more sense. He's got a, he's got a hair trigger. In, in, you know, in Jaws, you, I mean, probably rightly, you never see, like, the beach community like the people who are the, you never see the tourists up right. close like you do in this movie so like this is one of the few points where again the the, the two different movies that minimally two different movies that are going on here intersect story you know in terms of story and it's kind of like it's it's interesting because you've seen the perspective of the tourists as well which is something you never you don't actually see in jaws because who gives a right. shit but this movie gives a shit. <laughs> we have to flesh out every yeah. single one of these people staying at this hotel. Well, fl I yeah, mean, flesh, the, the, you know, that's generous. But, give you know, give them color, for sure. Individualize definitely give them. them. Individualize yeah. them. Yeah, they're not yeah, just, they're it's not like just in, the, 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 the crowd on the beach. Right, exactly. Until they are the crowd on the beach, and then they just it's just ludicrous. Literally. It's like yeah, the, the, suddenly they're running away from, um, you know, piranhas with faces and it's on wires, like, <laughs> yeah. rubber, rubber <laughs> fish with faces. And it's and, and it's like they're they're running away back to their own movie. Yeah. The, again, their episode of Love Boat that they thought they were in. <laughs> yeah. Where they thought they were going to find love at the end of it. And instead, like, like it's like Love Boat gets like a. Uh, 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 you know, it's as if an episode of Love Boat abruptly turned into um, Speed Two. You know, it's like you just sort of electric like... boogaloo, or like, or like in you know Westworld, the TV series when they accidentally wander into a different theme park. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like a different, a different, uh, like experiential reality. You know, like what's going on on this side of the island? <laughs> yeah, it 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 did feel it did feel. Um, out of place in that way. And I think, again, going back to the hotel owner, this is another situation. Raul. Raul. This is another situation where the head of the corporate entity has, has veto power over law enforcement. Like in, yeah, a, pe exactly. in a pecking order, this is where it doesn't like, in, at least in Jaws, they were like, okay, the sheriff answers to the mayor. I get that. You know, um, yeah. the mayor is, an idiot and he's thinking about profit but he's at least the mayor and they're they're like respecting an actual chain of command but again exactly, in, in yeah. cameron movies in cameron movies the military serves at the pleasure of corporations mm -hmm. mm. period and and so here we it's have true. that again and so I, yeah. I i keep going to like you know the whole the quotes of cameron saying it's not my movie you know i only worked on it for two weeks i'm like <laughs> fuck you dude i see your fingerprints all exactly. over this right but, and it, but isn't it possible it that so he feels like a cameron movie but isn't it possible that he he you know the the weird mix of of themes and ideas that are concentrated in this one-off movie is something that cameron liked more than he's willing to admit and put into his later work just to, just like he plucked lance hendrickson from this and was like oh yeah this guy could carry one of my movies yeah i think that's equally yeah. fascinating whether or not he um that what i'm hearing you say is like did he bring all of these things to bear on this movie or did this movie inspire those things in later movies is that are we witnessing sort of the the inculcation of certain cam cameron-esque 
um, uh, 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 elements to story and storytelling. Um, I because think because he didn't a... he didn't have any say in the store in the in the script, right? It's I hard. To did, bit, it's hard to say. Oh, he did. It's hard to know. I think he did actually. Cause okay, because because you know some the, time the... rewriting it. Oh, okay. Well, that may I mean that makes sense because the way the way that this kind of story comes out, the fact that he's interested in in family and families forged out of crisis and the reintegration of family units, those seem, you know, from the outside, like James Cameron things that he puts in movies. And that's like, (laughs) that That could be another title. James Cameron things that he puts in movies. Yeah. Um, (laughs) It's, so it's I possible mean, that we can't quite that we can't quite put our finger on 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 um, whether or not like he brought this stuff or this stuff inspired um, later versions. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's one of the things, at least on an intellectual level, that makes watching this movie really um, uh, satisfying. Um, yeah, because, I agree. Because um, yeah, you see these germs of ideas that get played out. Uh, on larger canvases later on in his career. And, and this is not like James Cameron is, you know, one of the most, if not the most, I mean, he's right up there with Spielberg in terms of popularity of his movies. You know, he yeah. hasn't done as much, yeah. but what he does. People get, go see. Gets to, people go see and, 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 and wheedles its way into the, into the national and international sort of unconscious. Yeah. And, um, uh, and and speaks to large numbers of people, and so it's like in the same way when you want you you have these kind of big directors with these great bodies of work, and you watch their early stuff, you can kind of see the um, uh, the germination process at mm-hmm. work, and and so while he while Cameron himself d- d- disowns this movie. Um, I would, I would the say the movie doesn't to, disown him. It, yeah, I would. I, I, that's such a good way to put it. I would say, like anybody who wants to be a student of Cameron's films should watch this movie and see yeah. some of these bigger ideas played out on a smaller scale in sort of almost like a in a, in a petri dish. Um, uh, I just happened to be watching, uh, completely coincidentally, watching the making of Aliens documentary the other day. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me. First, that I never, I didn't really understand because Aliens is so different from Aliens in so many ways. Uh, James Cameron is was a huge fan of Alien, like a cultish fan of Alien. Mm. And you know, you mentioned that he worked with Roger Corman, and one of the movies he did with Roger Corman was, uh, you know, like an Alien ripoff, oh, Galaxy okay. of Terror. Oh wow! And I really feel that in this movie too that that uh, you know he f- and he says in that movie it's like it would be it, it wouldn't be uh, fair to Alien this movie that I love so much to make Aliens a clone of Alien, um, but I feel like he thinks that this is the perfect forum to make a make like an Alien clone, <laughs> and I think that's largely what he does. But also there's like a slip of a tongue from his producer who calls aliens his directorial debut and then she she considers for a second and goes actually no it wasn't his first film piranhas 2 the spawning was his first film i thought like that's the kind of like it's like a repressed memory that everyone has to come (laughs) to terms with that that this really is his first film but we don't want to admit it and you know everyone who's around cameron has to buy into this idea that that you know his first movie was uh Sorry, Ter- Terminator, not Aliens. His first movie right. was like an instant masterpiece. I mean, I think this is a right. masterpiece, but for very different reasons. For very I, different and reasons. The rest I, of hang the world on, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll finish up talking about Piranha 2, The Spawning, The Flying Killers. Right after this. <laughs> If you like podcasts like I do, boy, do I have a treat for you. You need to stay on target and check out the Sounds and Cinema podcast. 
Listen as your host, sound designer and music creator, Tony Parham, and co-host, musical performer and sound lover, Derek Hansen, D-Rock if you're nasty, and I am, discuss all things sound related to film, television, stage, and theatrical productions. They discuss environmental sounds, bioacoustics, dialogue, the nature of communication through sound, but as an added bonus, they drink beer and try to... Stay on target! Find them wherever you get your podcasts and listen to the pure mania of a man who can charitably be described as Doug the Dog from Up and another man with a soothing and sultry voice trying to get that man to... Stay on target! That's the Sounds and Cinema Podcast. Tune in and listen to the sounds they are creating just for you. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom, Matt, and myself are here talking about Piranha 2 The Spawning. I'm saying it. Directed by fucking James Cameron. Yes. Matt, you had a question for us. I did. I had a question for you guys because you were the sequel ex- experts. And you have watched more sequels than anyone can or should um, <laughs> in their lives. Um, I only ask Agreed. this because um, I worked on a project a few years ago where it was kind of a sequel, kind of a reboot. And um, we had to wrestle a lot with, like, what makes a good sequel. Um, And ironically, we came upon James Cameron talking on the subject. And he Mm -hmm. was talking about it in terms, when he was making Terminator 2. And he was saying that, um, uh, he said that a sequel should, I think these were his words, um, be exactly the same as the original uh, and completely different. Um, and and I have since... Um, that sounds like Terminator 2. I- exactly. And and he also talked about surprises. And, and, he, and he his point... His point, yeah. his point was that um, all the surprises should be pleasant ones. So if you look at Aliens and then you look at Alien 3... Like it starts off. Alien Three starts off with right. with the with Newt killing with Newt and the and uh, and um, Hicks Hicks dead. And you're like, Guys, that's a you surprise. Just ruined it's that also... movie for me. I was waiting. Yeah, spoiler. To watch it for this it, podcast. It's a surprise. It's a surprise, but it's a it's a really unpleasant one. And so those two. I think you those... mentioned on this podcast that reveal, Tom. So. <laughs> those two. Yeah, I know. Th- no, those two qualifications. I have. I have kind of. I keep coming back to them as like keep all make all surprises pleasant ones um and make it exactly the same but completely different which i have have kind of reworded into um give them uh, everything they want and nothing they expect you Hmm. know and that and i've derived that from 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 uh from cameron and here Mm -hmm. we have cameron who his first movie is a sequel yeah um it does is it do you a do you agree with sort of his outlook on sequels and what a sequel should do and then b do you think he actually uh, accomplishes it here i'm of two minds because intellectually hearing that argument described to me yeah (laughs) i on the surface i would agree with it but i will tell you that I can say without equivocation, the very first time I saw Alien 3, that didn't piss me off. Mm. I thought, wow, that's a fucking big swing. And it didn't bother me. Having said that, I can see how it would bother some. Like if somebody said, I just can't believe they fucking did that. I can understand that argument. Oh, but yeah. But do you think? Do but, you think you know, this I, movie is this? Maybe not having seen Piranha, but well, I've seen Piranha, but I, I mean, I saw it so long, I don't remember a single frame from it. I guess what I'm saying is that, like, <laughs> I can I can look at this as a sequel and see, um, that for me it it gives. It give it gave me everything I wanted and nothing I expected. Like it, it of course was absolutely baseline killer fish, mm. and then you have to kind of up it, and so it's like and boy did they flying genetically engineered military grade killer fish, you know? 
um, as opposed to, um, you know, some sequels will take, you know, like like what he did with Alien, which was like, um, you know, you, you like Alien. Well, what if we put an S well, at the end? Well, here's a hundred. Yeah, of let, let's just put an <laughs> S at the end of it, and then and that's what we're gonna do. And and in some ways, like P- Piranha Two, just kind of has an S at the end of it. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> if people spawning, didn't like their like... alien, people just didn't like their aliens to the root of three. Right. The power of three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's. But I think Alien Three is an undervalued for sure. But do you, do you think that I, this I, is a good sequel? And like, what makes yeah. a good sequel for you guys? Like, what is the what are the, what is the 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 litmus test? I was very surprised that that I thought that this movie is as good as I think it is. Now, granted, it's in an arena of somewhere in the the, the vicinity of so bad it's good. But like I said before, I can see the the DNA of a good Cameron yeah. film within this movie. It's there. Yeah. And so if you're looking for the box checks of things that I would find interesting, that I've found compelling in other Cameron films, a female lead at the center check that box you know like you were speaking to the s i think that box is checked in this film by virtue of i mean piranha even in the first movie it's a school of piranha there's a lot of piranha but add the flying and add the gen the genetically modified military grade it checks that box and so i don't know i just It's not as successful as other films, you know. You have uh, <laughs> Tom in your in our introductory episode. Your quotable was from I forget the character's name. What's the character's name? Who's fishing with the dynamite? Oh, with his son. Uh, I don't know, King Kong Islander. I don't know what his name is. <laughs> okay, but at any rate, you have this, you know, vaguely not even vaguely this overtly racist kind of moment. But hey, it's okay because they're friends, yeah. they're pals, they're just giving each other shit. And then his son dies, and his anguish over his son I found very compelling. And so I kind of equate that to the the one at a time deaths you see in Aliens, where you go, no, not, not you know, that guy. not Vasquez, yeah, yeah. Oh, not to mention the the morgue assistant. And so who, I see you know, those screen... boxes she has... checked. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to... So, I mean, what do you think, What Tom? do I like... think? Um, I think it's definitely... I mean, it is... It's kind of... It doesn't really answer your question, but it's the unending question that will haunt this podcast forever, which is, like, what what level of fidelity to the original movie do we want, expect, like? And how does that that affect the sequel? I think, I think every every sequel should be taken on its own as its own movie judged by success on its own terms but and you know we tr- we try and we try and cut the snake off at the head and watch it wriggle to a slow death i believe that's the analogy i've used before but um <laughs> it's sequels are built on that tension and i think the more successful sequels are the one that embrace that and try and find the right balance of those two things rather than being exclusive to one or the other um and so you know the idea i suppose another way of looking at what cameron's talking about is like you bring you know you you have the same material but you have a new director's take on it um Mm -hmm. you know that's something we we find a lot or you reinter you reinterpret what genre this belongs to that's kind of hard to do with piranha because it's already a mix of comedy and horror uh and that same mix is here but it's all it's the comedy and horror i mean in, in joe dante's way it approach comedy and horror are one and the same yeah and yeah. in here they're segregated almost you have a very serious side of the movie and a very stupidly comic side of the movie 
Yeah, and that's so where you feel this movie like is two delivering, directors, perhaps, delivering, perhaps, but just yeah. not in the ways you expect. There's another moment where I really, uh, because as silly as this movie is, I thought I would like it only on the silly plane. But yeah. there's a moment towards the end where uh, I can't remember if it was a worker from the hotel or there's there's an African American man by the water. And all of a sudden, you hear the... But you don't see the attack. Yeah. And we cut away from him. And when we come back, his body is mangled, but he's walking. He's That's staggering. Right. And it is a really beautiful, horrifying yeah. bit of body horror in that scene Definitely. that really worked for me, where I thought, well, okay, this... for it, Like... For the horror genre, that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and... but there were there were sort of like um, a lot of sort of horror moments, you know, and like you know squishy blood gut sounds and uh, yeah, and but that, they all felt that... more like tropes. When the yeah. boob girls, when the mean boob girls die, they die sort of exactly in the way that you think they were. And because it's flying fish, it's a, still a bit comical. Yeah, it's really, like you were saying, Tom, like like those moments where it it's decidedly either it goes to silly or, in my opinion, when, when it goes to those horror-y tropes, um, whether Cameron directed those scenes or not, right. um, you know, we know at least he's on record for saying that he was at least involved. He was in Rome when it was being recut and, mm -hmm. you know, and so yeah. whether he directed the scenes that were shot that day, he was, he was aggressively involved in the cutting of the film. Yeah. And, and so, uh, he, he is somebody who, unlike Joe Dante, I can't, I have never seen a Cameron film that balances horror and humor. Like that's just not his, that's not, no, that's not his thing. Mm -hmm. Right. He he can balance sci-fi with with pathos. He can balance and action too. You know, and action like yeah. and, and he sure. can take a movie like Alien, which was a horror movie, and turn it into a sci-fi action uh, film, yeah. and that has less to do with horror and more with you know a, spe a different kind and of his spectacle. movies have funny moments, but they're not chuckles. I mean, it's comedic yeah, it's, in the way that this movie is. It's. Comedic. Yeah, and 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 I think the 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 study between uh, on this one the study between James Cameron and Joe Dante is fantastic. It's fascinating, and you can see like this is what Gremlins would have like. Like you think about like Gremlins, like if if yeah. if if James Cameron had directed Gremlins two, you would have the same sort of like, huh, this is kind of funky. But instead, Joe Dante, um, uh, you know balances well listen with... back to a previous episode and, yeah. and we'll and, and we'll tell you but there are no answers to that question right. <laughs> as, to, as to what joe dante does in that movie but there's a lot of speculation well what i'm saying is i guess um, um i think the in the four movies that we're talking about um in this in this grouping mm. for me anyway this is the only good sequel like this is the only one that really um, scratches the sequel itch for me. That's interesting. Um, I, I think again, like I said, I said in the beginning, the, like on paper, the premise, the premises for all of four of these films are perfectly solid. Um, mm -hmm. But in the delivery of them, I feel like Grease Two almost got there. Like it almost delivered a musical sequel to Grease. I said, you know, it was the last half hour, last forty five minutes where right. I finally felt like it was in it. A Grease sequel. Um, you know, Airplane 2 was a, a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of, of, the, of the original. It wasn't a sequel. It was a, it was a, a rehash. It was, you know, um, and we'll get to Halloween 3. But Piranha 2 just feels like, um, it feels like a satisfying right. sequel to me. Like, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Like, it feels like a satisfying part 2. And then, and then we should talk or we should at least caveat that 30 years later they make piranha three and they do what you're talking about tom which is they decide what if we made it a comedy what if we yeah full what on. if we sharknadoed this full thing? on yeah and right and put paul what, Shear in it 
Go ahead, Tom. Let me have it. You think I'm full of shit? I what? think it's I, I I before you because I, I I I want to hear what you say about this, Tom. But I I would <laughs> I would preface this by saying like, in the moment. You know, all four of these movies were were unmitigated failures financially financially yeah and killed each one of their franchises so yeah. that 30 years later somebody sort of revisited piranha and said what if we made a campy version of this to me is uh is it a sequel i don't know it's a it's a it's a it's not it's a <laughs> A reimagining it's a it's a reboot i would put it under it's the, a reboot i would put it under the category of reboot but i i i i will um i will cede the rest of my time to the um to the gentleman to the distinguished to man the, from, the distinguished I'll, gentleman I'll, from hey, the closet you let us do superman returns and i'll stop this whole line of questioning mike <laughs> no i have stated before because i completely forgot about <laughs> superman returns and when we did Superman, I, <laughs> after we had recorded, I watched about the first half of it, and then I had something else to do. I never got back to the second half. But I do remember thinking at the time, oh, fuck, that's a sequel. We should we should have done that. Well, you, but I mean, so you're right. It's about that. But I'm not wrong about Piranha 3D. It's, that's a reboot. It's a it's a it's a gray area because we the way we've been defining sequels is about continuity. Mm. Is is Piranha 3 it part of the same cinematic no. universe? Because because no. we've done we've done it's like pre, we've it done takes place on like a lake in, in Arizona, right? Hmm. So it's like... And the three has nothing to do with the third installment. It's just the beginning of 3D. Wow, this is, we're getting into semantics, maybe. Um. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, you know, uh, I, I'm going to do the f movies that most annoy Mike to watch. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and then I'll think of the rationalizations for that later. But um, Which ones are those? <laughs> Twilight's on its you way. You can't find a movie I won't watch. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, what, what was the what was the original point? I had? The original idea was Matt. Well, Matt's asking about is this a, Piranha three D and three double? Where do you put and... where do you put the most recent Piranhas in this? Uh... Oh, I haven't seen them. I'm not oh, okay. gonna. Great. <laughs> so can, I, can I don't we, can... I don't think I don't think deciding to go f uh, I don't know I mean like what's the connective tissue to Piranha here? This is our podcast. We can do yeah. whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> Actually, while true. you were talking, I thought of an alternative <laughs> title, another alternative title for, for uh, this one. Pir Piranha Two. They fly now. They fly now. They fly now. Yes, that's great. <laughs> I, can we um, uh, let's end on a positive note and talk about things? I, I, I have to share things that I, I didn't like actually about this. This that's the positive yes. note. Um, <laughs> that um, guys, I have zero gripes. <laughs> oh my god! I actually felt like I'll put it this way: I felt like the Grunion Run was our climax. And everything after sort of felt like we were plodding along, like going, doing, going back underwater, back to the shipwreck, back to the place we've been to three or four times. Kind of felt, yeah. it kind of felt like, you know, that thriftiness of like, okay, we've got, you know, it, it's like the producer says, look, my friend's boat sunk. <laughs> they're, they're not going to take it up from the bottom of the ocean for another five days. We have five days to shoot in this boat to get as much and yeah, so exactly. and so we're going to set as much as we can in this boat um over five days and so we go back to this boat and i feel like even the even the music just started to feel like a dirge just like we were like just like marching inexorably toward a very predictable ending but then mm. but then lance hendrickson shows up in a helicopter to rescue and jumps out of it he he is he is alone in a helicopter so if, if you haven't seen the movie imagine this <laughs> There, the people are in distress. His son is in distress. Um, his wife, ex-wife, is in distress. 
uh, secret agent Tyler is in, in distress <laughs> and he shows up on the scene and the secret scene agent is, agent is the Tyler. middle of the water. He shows up on the scene with the helicopter and he's going to save everybody. Now one might lower a rope. <laughs> <laughs> no. One, right? one might bring a, a friend. Perhaps to lower a if rope. You, if you had the money, you might at least have one of those uh, helicopters, like for, that Abraham Lincoln was piloting in Jaws Two. Right, you might have it. Yeah, with the pontoons on the bottom. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, that exactly. could land. Um, but what does Lance Hendrickson do? He takes one look at the situation. He jumps out of the helicopter, leaving the helicopter pilotless. It spins out of control and explodes against the surface of the water. Mm-hmm. And at that yeah. moment, I went, you, you had me at hello, movie. You had me at hello. <laughs> you had me at helicopter. Not only that, behind the scenes, Lance Hendrickson almost drowned doing that oh, scene. No Seriously? shit. Because his boots, the boots he was wearing filled up with water and started acting like cement oh. shoes. <laughs> I, I I couldn't believe, I wrote in my notes that he, uh, Lance Hendrickson threw away a helicopter like it was an empty gun in a John Woo movie. Yes. <laughs> or like an empty beer can. Yeah. Like, like, just, like I've, he, I've never seen that. I've not, I mean, you, you mentioned like you've never seen the, the flying fish attack and then out the window. It's like, I've never seen anyone throw away a helicopter. A, a municipal helicopter. <laughs> yeah, that that was my note. <laughs> that was my note. My note exactly. I said he jumped out of a municipal helicopter. <laughs> Who's paying for that? Maybe the hotel, which is why the the hotelier uh, has so much right uh, to say about how law. Well, maybe is he's the in... real hero of this. Keep hey, in, was anybody keep else Steve now? Fiscal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Steve's the loose cannon. Yeah, did I get this wrong, or did Captain uh, Asshole Hotel Manager Raul. not die? Raul, I don't, sit- no. I don't remember. I don't remember. Sitting on his beach chair, running hunt. the Grunion hunt. Yes, and then piranhas show up yeah. flying piranhas kill 50 people but not him he didn't get us come i was eagerly yeah. anticipating his death and i did not see it and we and also don't know air. we also don't know what happened to mal the stuttering chef after he fell in the water yes there is a subplot um right. for, for the listeners there's a subplot of of naked lady pirates who who show up <laughs> at the resort they try to steal food steal from food. the kitchen are walked in on by a, a what he, he he describes himself as, as an, an amateur amateur, amateur chef, shoe chef. He's he, a chef he was a restaurant he's, 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 he is wearing a chef's uniform he is in the restaurant kitchen he has a distinct <laughs> and, and disruptive movie. stutter <laughs> And he describes himself and and pitches himself to this woman who he finds very attractive. He wants to make them dinner, and his his bona fides are that he is an amateur chef, and he will bring the food to the to, uh, the, boat. to the boat. And Which so is mainly late... corned beef, by the way. <laughs> yes, it's a bunch of tin yes. food that he brings in a cardboard box. It's not exactly the makings of a. He might actually be an amateur chef. And when, when, when we see what he's brought, we go, yeah, you probably yeah, are yeah, an amateur yes. chef. And he probably just like likes to wear the outfit. He doesn't, he's, he's like a guest in the hotel, I think. Um, and so he goes to the boat. They get the food, uh, but then they, they unmoor themselves or he unmoors them. Uh, they start to drift away. They encourage him to jump into the water. So... Which he misses wildly. And so so he jumps for the boat and he lands in the water. Now, we're in a movie called Piranha. (laughs) And naked lady pirates have just lured a rube to jump off of a pier into the water. What do you think happens next? Nothing. Nothing Nothing. happens. You would think (laughs) that he would get eaten and that they would have to... Like, it feels like this entire subplot was building toward just getting him in the water. And that was the punchline of the joke. And then the next time we see the pirate ladies, they are on the boat. One of them somehow falls in the water and she gets eaten by a piranha. Fine. But it, it felt like such a weird... Uh, like, like it, 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 this was not just a 
bit gag. This this scene took minutes of screen time. Mm -hmm. It spanned several locations. Um, involved three different actors, props, costumes. Um, this oh. was day. This was days and days of work. <laughs> I'm telling you, this was not easy, what they did. Um, uh, it, it, these are not characters that appeared in other parts of the movie. They, there, was, there was this own self-contained storyline yeah. of the lady pirates and, and Ken, the stuttering amateur chef. Where <laughs> what, he fell in the water. He fell in the water. The we never, like Sid Caesar, who <laughs> falls into the mysterious pit in the end zone in Greece 2. We, mm, never, right. we never see him come out. Yeah. yeah. So he is because Davy that Jones's day, locker. whoever was directing said, "That's a wrap for Amateur Chef on Piranha Two: yeah. The Spawning the Flying Killers." Give him a round of applause. And the crew who numbered in the ones applauded. <laughs> um, it, it it just was this thing that was so odd and so not Cameron. It was like it was this was part, this was the half of the movie that. Um, you know, it was the TNA half. It was the. I was just gonna say well, it's that, like it's, that half only existed to see boobs. It's the yes. well. That that's. I mean, that's one of the weird intersections because uh, you know that that these nude lady pirates they just they they sit around in boobs on their boat. Yes, like, that's the, <laughs> the best way of putting it. Boobs. Like <laughs> reciting poetry or something. What were well, they doing? It's just to, I guess to introduce the idea that they're pirates by reading about pirates. Uh, right, but I, right. I just you know that whole thing that is like that that scene would not look out of place in a Dario Argento movie. Mm -hmm. The Mal the Stuttering Chef is this, you know, again, this kind of like Gilligan's Island, Faulty Towers, weird sitcom. So it's this weird intersection of those two worlds. But you're absolutely right in like neither of them go anywhere. Yeah, no. That's anywhere. the interesting part for me as a spectator. I'm like... I'm like, like, what is the, is, I mean, these, there's colorful characters who, you know, some of them exist to be killed and then others exist just for the sake of existing. Or just they're in a movie completely hermetically sealed from the rest of the movie. Yeah. From, they don't interact with any of the other characters. They don't know about the other characters. They don't even know. They don't know about them. They don't yeah. know. Nobody knows about it. It's just com completely hermetically sealed, which makes it this, again, this, um, it, it, it contributes to sort of the time amateurish color. quality of, 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 of this movie and, and the, right. um, and the, again, the Matt, we're movie. just trying to get to 86, 87 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like, as you were saying, Tom, like, there's a director's cut. And it's shorter. Yeah. And that's that's never a, a good sign. Um, I, I think. And, and, well, what I, and this is a lot. All right. Do we have uh... the only the only thing I would have cut is uh, I mean, and this is not a uh, this is not directed specifically at this movie. I have a real, you know, I have a real aversion to underwater sequences in movies. Uh, I mean. You know, Thunderball. Because of James Bond Thunderball? Yeah, James Bond Thunderball. Damn it, I was the just, one that brought it up. It's just... I mean, Why do you have an aversion to them? They're so slow. It just it takes like a nosedive in pace. And this movie has mm. ha, has it in the, in the pre-credit sequence. Like, that's how early there is a, like an underwater sequence. But what I don't understand, and again, this is not particular to this movie... When you have underwater sequences... You must hate the abyss. <laughs> when you have underwater sequences in movies, <laughs> why is the music so slow? I feel like if I was making it, I would want to, you know, I would want to disguise the fact that we're going slower than normal. Like, <laughs> put a bit of yakety sax under there, not this, you know. I mean, it's all a variation <laughs> on the Thunderball. Do, 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 do. Dude, it sound it's like why go slower than we're already going <laughs> so that's all i would cut from the movie but i don't know then you might have a movie that's under an hour so yeah, i don't know then what you're, 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 you're 57 say. and a half minutes gonna, if you've yeah, got the underwater stuff. six minutes bro wow you're, you're like all legally right. not a feature yeah. does anybody <laughs> have any uh last comments about piranha 2 the spawning before we move on to halloween 3 season of the witch i have only this to say it was entertaining in its madness. 
Was it good? <laughs> was it a good movie? No. Do I want everybody to stop what they're doing and go watch it? Yes. <laughs> Completely. Completely. I reply, is it a good movie? Yes. <laughs> I just I, I want to give like a just just to like a, an example to let people know really what they're getting into here. There's a scene with a helicopter. Not 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 the throwing away the helicopter. It's just a helicopter parked. I don't know what the term is for when the helicopter is stationary. Um, now this it. It's all and it's all ADR, which apparently this entire movie is anyway. Even when people are speaking, they're in ADR. Right. This scene could have been a phone call. In fact, it is a phone call with some images. The entire scene is out of focus. There's no way to sugarcoat it. It is not in focus. So you have a scene that I is that was necessary. Me. I thought I was <laughs> where the characters cannot be physically seen by your eye. That's the kind of movie you're getting into. But yeah. but embrace it, enjoy it, because the madness is part of the fun, as, as Matt alluded to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, for <laughs> Piranha 2 The Spawning. If you have uh, something we missed... No, I don't think you were listening. But by all means, find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Send us an email to everythingsequel at gmail.com, and we will respond to you. All right, that's it. 6% on Rotten Tomatoes, this movie, by the way. Makes me mad. That is offensive. That's offensive. How dare Bullshit. you? Bullshit. Open your mind. All right. For Tom Stewart from Lonesome Whistle Productions and Matthew Aldrich, our special guest host, my name is Michael Schantz of the How Dare You Awards. We will see you next time for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Put on your boxing gloves, gentlemen. Ding, ding. So long, everyone. We got a data down at the docks. <laughs> I really hope that's the term they actually use but I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs>